Kaya Girl, Chapter 4 Sorry, madam, I said, with an ingratiating smile as the customer marched into the shop. I scuttled after her with a quick backward nod at Pfizer, who was already melting into her surroundings. I was nervous that she would complain to Aunt Lydia. She looked the type. By the same my apology had done the trick because she said nothing and allowed herself to be fast over by auntie, pointing at the most expensive lace fabrics. I had a feeling fires that would be needed for this purchase. The lady chose my favorite cloth in the shop, a peach lace encrusted with specks of diamonds that were hardly visible but sparkled fabulously when they caught the light. It was that hidden brilliance that I loved. When Auntie opened it out, a hundred tiny gems caught the fluorescent lights overhead and I could not help gasping. The lady looked at me with a smile. You have a good taste like me. She said with a wink. Suddenly, I recognized her. She was the one who had come into the shop in the mesmerizing outfit the day I had met Faiza. I liked her after the compliment and was glad she was the one to buy my favorite cloth. It was the only one of its kind in the shop and I was sorry to see it go. But at the same time, I felt auntie's pride in a good sale. I thought of Pfizer's description of her auntie's cloth with the glints of gold. I knew how she felt about it. One day, I too will own gorgeous fabrics, I thought. I wondered sadly if Pfizer ever would. Not if she remained a Kayayo. That was for sure. The lady also bought some high-heeled gold shoes and a matching bag. My daughter is having her engagement next month, she announced proudly. Well, Auntie really pulled out all the stops after that. I from Ami, mother of the bride, she exclaimed. We have to make sure you look like a queen, so that when they come to take your daughter, they will know where she is coming from. The lady agreed, beaming. I could just picture her in the lace and gold accessories, splendid as the sunshine. She chose two other lace fabrics, two kente cloth and a glinting piece of asuke. The bride will have to change her outfit several times, she explained. Call your friend. Auntie finally instructed me when the lady was done. It was almost an hour later. She had fallen in love with the shop and while chatting with auntie, had decided to buy pretty things for all her daughters, not just the bride. This auntie of mine, I thought with a smile as I stepped outside. People didn't even notice when she was wooing their money out of them. She had even managed to get herself invited to the engagement. I shaded my eyes against the blinding outdoors and Pfizer appeared as magical as she has disappeared. I saw a look of recognition and then of slight puzzlement on the lady's face as Pfizer entered the shop and she realized that this Kayayo really was my friend. This time, Auntie herself wanted to accompany the lady to the car park so I stayed in the shop. I pictured the engagement ceremony with all the women in their finery looking good, smelling good, feeling good. The bride's family would sit on one side and the grooms on the other. In a stylish procession, the young woman of his family will carry in bowl after bowl on their heads like Pfizer. But these bowls will be full of lavishly wrapped gifts for the bride and her family. The family so charming will say that their son had seen a lovely flower in the garden of their prospective in-laws and had come to ask if they could pick it. She would joke and sing and everyone would join in and be in the best of moods. After a certain number of items had been presented, the bride would ask her first appearance and made a procession of shouting I fro don't do. In my mind's eye, she was a lovely young girl draped in glittering lace and beautiful beads smiling shyly in the middle of the noisy procession and scanning the crowd for her beloved. But then my daydream sweet tracks and she turned into Asana, sad and weeping, had been given to old a large brown seeds. What different things marriage could be, I mused. 
The increased volume of the TV interrupted my thoughts. Gifty had turned it up, taking advantage of Auntie's absence to watch her favorite Mexican telenovela. A handsome man and a beautiful woman were saying how much they loved each other. Their faces moved closer as if pulled by invisible strings between their unblinking eyes. As their lips touched, I thought of a large brown teeth again. I shuddered and turned away. Ah, what is wrong with you? asked Gifty. You don't like kissing or what? She continued in a tone of one who did it all the time. That was typical of her. I couldn't help rising to the bait. And you? Have you kissed? I asked. My boyfriend. She responded with a gesture like a rap artist, dropping the D in the bait to sound American. It irritated me so much when she did that. She seemed to think she needed to impress me that way and could clearly not see that she was doing the offset. What boyfriend? I wanted to ask, but thought better of it. She will only invent some story that will waste my time. I pitied her for needing to be some invented person with an invented accent and invented lifestyle to impress me. I wondered when Faiza would be back. Gifty's fakeness always made me long for her company. The way I would long for a salty piece of Kobe after eating too many sweets. As if she had heard my thoughts, Faiza knocked lightly on the door. I knew it was her because that was how she knocked when she knew Aunt Lydia was not there and wanted to find out if I was free. I opened the door eagerly. Your auntie said I should tell you she is going to take the lady to her seamstress. She informed us. She said you should watch the shop for her. This was good news. With the traffic and the chatter, those two had stunk up. She will be away for a good while. Whenever she asked us to watch the shop, it meant that she was not hurrying back. I was dying to hear the continuation of Pfizer's story. But at the same time, I had been waiting to show her the internet and this was too good an opportunity to miss. There was no way to describe it to her without her actually seeing it for herself. The story will have to wait. I beckoned her inside. She hesitated. I usually came outside rather than asking her in. But this time, I was confident because I knew we had time. Although Auntie had become much more relaxed with Pfizer and I suspected almost going to like her, it was a tacit rule that we conducted our friendship outside the shop and that she only came in to carry customers' goods. I was not too worried about Gifty because much of her resented Pfizer. I knew she would not want to get into my bad books by reporting me. Moreover, I was older than her and she was a little scared of me. Faiza knew about computers but had never been this close to one and she gave a little jump backward. When it harmed into life at the touch of my finger, Gifty guffered but we both ignored her. That was something she disliked about Faiza. That her contempt just seemed to bounce off the girl and come back right to her. She went suddenly back to her telenovela, raising the volume higher, still to spite us. I was glad, as it gave us some privacy. Pfizer watched the changing display of the laptop screen closely as it booted to life, and I could almost see her thoughts racing just as fast. I googled Tolong and found a website that gave some facts about the area. I read and translated them and she exclaimed in fascination, Yes, it is true. Those are the things we found. How do they know? I showed her a landscape photo with termite hill and a shared nut tree. And she cried out in excitement. Yes, it is really our place. When I clicked on a photo of a mox, and as it loaded in full size, she recognized it with a loud wait, and her smile almost encircled her whole face. My uncle rides there on his bicycle every Friday for prayers, she said. I told her the population of the town and she pointed to me and said, you have never been there and yet you are able to tell me how many people are living there. And she shook her head in wonder. 
I read out a list of villages in the vicinity and she laughed at my pronunciation till tears flowed down her cheeks. I was laughing too, clowning around. She would struggle to recognize each name and the moment she did, would call out the correct version in delighted recognition. My attempts to copy her drew fresh laughter from both of us, especially when I tried to produce a sound she had made at the back of her throat that just did not exist in any other language I knew. Gifty shushed us, but we ignored her, and she turned back to the TV, sounding a loud between her teeth. I wanted to Google something else, but Faiza made me continue with the list of villages, hoping to hear her own, and sure enough, when we made it out through my mangled pronunciation, she gave a joyful little giggle. It was one of the real tongue twisters, but I made an extra effort since it was her own village, and she made an extra effort to teach me the correct pronunciation. One day, I will come and visit you there, I told her. You are most welcome. She beamed and then added hesitantly, if only you can be comfortable at our place. I knew what she meant and I've never felt like braving the discomfort of village life before, but I felt differently now. It was a great afternoon from Pfizer's village. We went to America on the internet and I showed her the White House and the Statue of Liberty. She could not believe that people could go up into its crown. How can something built by human beings be so big? She marveled. So I took her to Egypt to show her what humans had built thousands of years ago. She could not believe that they had built the pyramids just to bury dead kings. Then we traveled millions of years back to see a dinosaur. She gave another jump backwards when T-Rex read up on the screen. Wait! She cried again. Look at his teeth. She had difficulty getting her mind around such vast time periods and also had trouble with the concept that dinosaurs had lived on Earth for longer than humans. Even the mere fact that they had existed was not to swallow when I explained to her that their remains helped to create the oil we now use for petrol. She scanned my face sharply. If she had not trusted me, she would have doubted her eyes and ears. She asked me what had happened to the dinosaurs, and I had told her what I had heard on the nature program on the Discovery Channel, that they had been killed by an asteroid crashing into the Earth. How to explain this properly was another challenge, and I googled website about the solar system and showed her the planets and tried to explain how they revolve around the sun. She asked me how we could possibly be revolving around something that rose and fall in the sky every day. I told her I didn't really know, but that she would just have to trust me on that one. If the people in my village knew all this, she whispered, they would never believe it. I had never appreciated the wonder of knowledge as much as I did that day. When I rediscovered the world through the eyes of someone, who had never really known it was out there. I wondered what it must be like to know so little and have no idea how much more there was to know. It suddenly seemed a great privilege to know things I had always taken for granted. I was surprised at myself. I had thought we would spend much of our time googling movie stars and fashion pages, downloading pop videos on YouTube, and drooling over handsome stars. I would never have thought we will have so much fun just finding about the world around us. I had never realized how interesting it was.